in this lesson, we'll be covering math ambidexterity by talking about how to manipulate the two most common ways non-integers are going to be processed arithmetically as either fractions or decimals. So let's start by just defining fractions. We know that the top of the fraction bar is what is known as the numerator. The bottom is what is known as the denominator. So rational values are what occurs when you have a numerator divided by a denominator. So this is just one of those technical terms that probably isn't going to be all that relevant, but that's technically what you've got. Anything that can be articulated as a fraction is what is known as a rational value. So for instance, three quarters of X divides X by four and then counts three of those four parts. That's technically what is occurring in the articulation of a fraction using this notation. Your greatest common factor is used to reduce a fraction to its least common denominator. So, for instance, four eighths can be written as one half because four eighths divided by four over four, which is one, and anything divided by itself is its, or sorry, anything divided by one is itself. So we know four eighths divided by four over four results in one half, and thereby we have proven that four eighths, four eighths is equal to one half because four eighths divided by one as four over four is still itself and also one half. <clears throat> now, taking fractions of wholes is one of the fastest ways to improve your speed with the problem solving on this exam. So three quarters of 120, most people will just write a one underneath the 120 as a fraction and multiply straight across, but we can do this a lot faster. We know that multiplication and division are ultimately the same level in our order of operations. So you can, instead of multiplying, keep the numbers smaller by dividing your whole by the denominator. So I know that 120 divided by 4 is 30. So 30 is 1 fourth of 120. Then we just multiply that quotient by the numerator. So 30 times 3 is 90, and that's three quarters of 120, and that's usually gonna be faster for people than going three times 120 is 360, 360 divided by four is 90. If that's easy for you, it's fine, but if it gets harder with bigger numbers, just keep it small by dividing by the denominator first when you're taking fractions of wholes. Now, another thing that can happen with fractions is you may be asked to add, subtract, or compare. And in that case, you need to create what is known as a common denominator. And you'll use what we like to call the bow tie method. And you can find other ways of least common denominator, but the bow tie is probably just the path of least resistance. And you don't want to overcomplicate things, make mistakes. You can just do this. So the first thing you need to do is multiply your denominators for the common denominator. So our new common denominator for the addition of two fifths plus three sevenths is gonna be 35. Then you will cross multiply your numerators to get your new numerators for each of the equivalent fractions now out of 35. So we know that 14 over 35 plus 15 over 35 is what we're now adding when we, or when we started with two fifths plus three sevenths so that we have the common denominator of 35. Then you keep the denominator common and do not change it, but sum the numerators only, and you get 14 plus 15 is 29 out of 35 is equal to two-fifths plus three-sevenths. Now, when you're multiplying or dividing fractions, however, it's generally a little bit easier. So first, you can multiply straight across. So two times uh, two-fifths times three-sevenths is going to be six thirty-fifths, because two times three is six. Five times seven is 35. Easiest bit that we've got. You don't need a common denominator. You just multiply straight across when you are multiplying fractions. But when you're dividing, you have to work left to right and multiply by what is known as a reciprocal. And the reciprocal is basically the inverted fraction. So if we were dividing two fifths by three sevenths, you'd rewrite that as two fifths times seven thirds. And then you'd multiply straight across left to right. So we'd do two fifths times seven thirds to get Two times seven for the numerator is 14. Five times three for the denominator is 15. And we discovered that 14 fifteenths is what you get when you divide three, uh, two fifths by three sevenths. So when it comes to adding, subtracting, and comparing, you need that common denominator. When it comes to multiplying and dividing, you do not. You just have to remember to multiply by the reciprocal when you're dividing by a fraction. And you'll just kind of work left to right. Now. 
there are some common fraction to decimal com conversions that we'll go through here that much like our divisibility rules can really help in estimation and expediting calculation and conversion from warm format to the other because we remember that we want to execute whatever technical math we have in the format of the answer choices so if my problem is in decimal i want to convert to fraction or vice versa and this list is intended to help so obviously one half 0 0.5 one third is going to be 0 0.3 repeating because it technically never stops and two thirds is going to be 0 0.66 rounding up to seven because that as well technically never stops and those lines atop the numbers indicate that they repeat then one quarter is half of a half, so that's going to be half of 0 0.5 or 0 0.25. And three quarters is going to be one half plus one quarter or 0 0.5 plus 0 0.25 or 0 0.75. One fifth is just 0 0.2. <clears throat> one sixth is going to be 0 0.1667 repeating. And five sixths is going to be 0 0.833 repeating. Again, we're just adding half of one third to our one-third and two-third respectively, or actually subtracting it. We're talking about the one-third. But you can see that there's some proportionality that if you know these fractions of decimal conversions, that you'll be able to exploit for other fractions that might not be here, such as like one-fifth being 0.2 tells me that three-fifths has to be 0.2 times three or 0.6. Then we've got our eighths. One-eighth is going to be 0 0.125, three-eighths is going to be 0 0.375, five-eighths is going to be 0 0.625, and seven-eighths is going to be 0 0.875, and that's basically by just adding or subtracting half of 0.25 respectively. So 0.25 divided by 2 would be 0.125, and you can see how that will apply to 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and 0 0.5 to get to these various odd numerated eighths. One ninth is one third divided by three. So that's just point 0.1 repeating. Again, you can see how two ninths would just be point 0.2 repeating and so on and so forth. And of course, one tenth is 0 0.1. So you don't need to memorize every fraction of decibel, but by knowing these, you could probably extrapolate those conversions to whatever the exact conversion you would like to use to expedite your processing of the problem solving question you're working on in the exam. Now, manually converting fractions to decimals. We're not going to do this a whole heck of a lot, but we'll see how it works at the very least. So consider three elevens. So you want to set up your long division with a decimal point. So we've got 11 dividing into 3.0. 11 goes into 30, however, two times because it doesn't go into three evenly at all a full time. So what we have to do is bring in the decimal and say that 11 goes into 30.2 times. Then we have to multiply that 0.2 times 11 and subtract out the 22, and that leaves us with 0.8. And of course, 11 is going to go into 80. It's going to do that seven times. And if we subtract out the 7 times 11, 77, we then get down to 30. And 11 is going to go into 30 once again two times. And at this point, we could see there's a repeating pattern. Once we see that, we could just put our little bar over top and we know that 3 elevenths is 0 0.27 and 272 or 0 0.27 repeating with the line over because it's never going to change that pattern. Again, this is something that you are unlikely to need to do on the exam. There's probably a more savvy path, but in case you do need to do it or just want to understand better how to convert the fractions and decimals in the abstract, this would be your approach. Now, decimals. Let's take a look at a relatively big number. So we've got 1,000 with the comma using the American notation and the point indicating the decimal. So I know that can change depending on where you are in the world, but this is going to be the notation for the GMAT. We know that the one here would be the thousands. And working to the right, the four is the hundreds. The zero is the tens. The five is the units. You may know it as the ones, but technically it should be the units. After the decimal point, we have two tenths and four hundredths and nine thousandths. So when you're manipulating decimals, you shouldn't really need to break it down to this level, but you know that you could write this out as 1,000 plus 400 plus zero because there's no tens plus five. And then on the right-hand side, 
we've got 2 over 10 plus 4 over 100 plus 9 over 1,000. Now, for manipulating decimals, you will want to multiply the entire equation by a power of 10 to eliminate the decimals. So if you had something like 0.2x is equal to 4y, you can multiply by 10 to get it to 2x is equal to 40y, and that makes it easier potentially to see that x is equal to 21. You can also use scientific notation, or 10 to some power, to manipulate your decimal expressions. So, for instance, 0 0.0009 can be rewritten as 0 0.0001 times 9. And I know that 0 0.0001 as an exponent can be written as 10 to the negative fourth. So I can rewrite this as 10 to the negative fourth times 9. And especially if you notice an answer choice or a set of answer choices that are dealing with exponential notation, that may be a faster way to work through decimal conversions and cancellations. So now that we've seen how fractions and decimals work technically, let's go on over to the whiteboard and take a look at a couple of example problems to see how you'll engage with these non-integer formats on the GMAT Focus yourself. So here we've got a sample question from the GMAT Focus. We set up our scratch work A through E as we always do. And we've got simple numbers, although they're fractions. So I probably would write these out. And I've got two thirds, three fifths, five sevenths, nine thirteenths, and eleven seventeenths. So we're being asked for which of the following values is greatest. So once again, if we're not looking for a single specific value, this is a logical evaluation clue. So we need to think about how we can manage this comparison in as efficient a path as possible. So we're just looking for which is greatest. And you might be looking at two thirds and going, well, I know that one's 0. 0.667. And we said in the lesson that three fifths is equal to 0. 0.6. So if I can void doing the comparison for everything, I'll go ahead and do that and go, well, I'm not going to have to worry about B. B is less than A. And I know that from common fraction to decimal, con decimal conversions. But then I look at the rest of them and I go, well, I actually probably don't know offhand what the decimal conversion is for sevenths, thirteenths, or seventeenths. So we'll just take, switch the color there, two-thirds versus five-sevenths. So we need a common denominator in order to compare. And so that common denominator will be 21. And again, we'll keep our verses. Then we multiply up and over, and we discover that we're looking at 14 21sts versus 15 21sts. And of course, 15 21st is bigger, so now we can eliminate choice A, and we just have to go through the remaining options using 5 sevenths as our new reigning champion, as it were, for our fractions. So we've got 5 sevenths versus 9 thirteenths this time. So once again, got to do a little common denominatoring. It's a technical term. And we can see 13 times 7, and we go 13 times 7 might be a little bit onerous, but not really. I know 10 times 7 is 70. I know 3 times 7 is uh, 21. So 70 plus 21 means that our common denominator is going to be 91. And since the common denominators are even at this point, I'm really just comparing our numerators. So we've got to multiply up and over. So 13 times 5 is going to be 65. And 9 times 7 is going to be 63. Again, very, very close, but the 5 sevenths remains the winner. So we can eliminate choice D. Then we've got to take our choice D, or sorry, choice C, our 5 sevenths once more, and go versus 11 seventeenths. And we get our common denominator first off from the bow tie. And once again, can do this relatively easily by going. 7 times 10, 70. 7 times 7, 49. So I know that 70 plus 50 would be 120, minus 1 to go back to 49. So I've got 119 as our new common denominator. And then we multiply up and over. 17 times 5 is going to be 85. 
and 7 times 11 is 77. And of course, we still have our reigning, defending fraction champion of choice C, or 5 sevenths. Takes a little bit of time, but recognize that the exam expects that when there's a relatively straightforward approach, you engage it, and you do it in under that two-minute-ish average. So let's go ahead and take a look at one more example, this time involving decimals. So this looks just ugly, right? And we clearly know that we're going to have some number of, you know, tens, and that's it. It's going to cancel somehow. So we want to convert these decimals into that scientific notation. So 0 0.06 can be rewritten as 6 times 10 to the negative 2, because we know that 10 to the negative 2 is equal to 1 over 100. So that's the notation. So now I could just do this for every one of my decimals. So 0 point, or 0 0.04 is going to be equal to 4 times 10 to the negative 2. We've got 0 0.0007, and that's going to be equal to 7 times 10 to the negative 4. And that's my numerator. So I'm going to start building this out over here. We're going to have 6 times 4 times 7. And then I know that when I combine my exponents, I add them if I'm multiplying the bases. So I've got 10 times 10 times 10. So I'm going to add all of those exponents. Of course, negative 2 plus negative 2 gives me negative 4. Negative 4 plus negative 4 gives me 10 to the negative 8 as my new numerator. Then we just got to go to our denominator. And we've got 0 0.00014. And that could be rewritten as 14 times 10 to the negative 5. And then we've got 0 0.012, and that's equal to 12 times 10 to the negative 3. And at this point, when I put in my denominator just the 10 part, I've got 10 to the negative 8 in the denominator. And if I divide anything by itself, it cancels. And if I'm savvy, I go ahead and I say, my tens are gone. So it has to be B without any other evaluation. But if you want to prove it out, I can see that 12 will cancel this six away entirely. And that two takes this two down to that. And when I've got a 14, well, that 14 cancels the seven and the two entirely. And once again, this cancels all the way down to one. So you have an example of how to deal with both manipulating fractions and decimals from a manual perspective. Go into our question bank to take a look at some more GMAT style examples. And of course, also feel free to visit mathaids.com for just manual calculation drills to improve your speed on these skills that the exam may not value as much as you expect.